Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Ruba Saleh and I'm the chair of the Center uh, for Migration and Diaspora Studies and a member of the Department of Anthropology. I'll just um, tell you a little bit about how the event is going to unfold. Um, so first of all, uh, we're going to give uh, the floor to uh, Kim Triton as um, she's our event organizer and she's going to take you through, through some information about the technical aspects of the event. Um, then we'll have uh, Professor Edward Simpson uh, with a word of welcome. Um, and then the event will um, officially kick, on, kick off with um, uh, Professor Hassan Haj. Um, so Kim, please, if you can spend a few words to explain how um, it's gonna work and how yes, to fix difficulties. Great, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we have got the meeting open so people will join um, throughout the next kind of 10 to 15 minutes, I believe. Uh, but thank you all for joining us again for this session. Um, just to let you know how this session will work. Um, if you can't hear audio or your visual goes out, um, the best thing to do is to exit the session and re-enter. I have set it up so that you can re-enter at any time. Um, there won't be a problem if you do leave um, and I will see that you've re-entered and admit you in. Um, just to let you know as well, um, in terms of, I'm sure you've all used Zoom at some point by now, I think we're all kind of used to it, but if you haven't, um, if you just scroll across the bottom, you will see that there is the chat box. So um, throughout the session today, if you have any queries, questions, discussion points um, around the topic or um, related to it, do feel free to drop them into the chat at any point of the session today. And then after we have the talk, we'll actually go back through um, the chat and pull out all your questions and we might ask if you want to ask them through the audio um, or we'll read them out and then ask if you have anything else you'd like to add to them. Um, you can also drop into the chat if you want to at the moment where you're calling in from and what drew you to the session if you would like. Um, the other thing to note is that we would ask that all your microphones are muted during the talk itself just it helps with any feedback noise um, and then what I'll do is once we enter into the Q&A part of the session, um, I will invite you and unmute you in order for you to be able to ask your question at that point. Um, and then, as I say, if there are any troubleshooting measures, do let me know in the chat. Um, if you think that the audio or visual problems might be on our end, do let us know on that as well. It might be that we need to exit and re-enter. Um, just one final note to say that these um, sessions are recorded, so it's just good to make you all aware of that. And for those of you who joined our last two sessions, the recordings of those two sessions will be going up on the Facebook group shortly. So sorry for any delays in that. We normally put a couple up each time. Um, so you'll be able to see that. And I will be sending an email around to all of you after today's session um, with all the links from where you can find the recordings for the session. So I think that's pretty much everything there. Do drop me. Um, so if you have any technical problems, do just drop me a note in the chat and just say, Kim, can you help me with this? Um, but I think that's everything you need to know from me. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. Um, and so without further ado, please, uh, Ed, if you can. Uh... Morning, everybody. My name is Ed. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Ed. I'm the head of the anthropology department at SOAS. Uh, and I'm here to welcome you all um, to the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies annual lecture, which is uh, going to be given by Professor Gassan Hajj today. But before Ruba introduces our speaker, uh, I would like to take a minute to introduce you to our host, because I think that's important as well. Our host today is Professor Salit Ruba, as she is commonly and affectionately known in our department. Ruba is the chair of our Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies at SOAS. The center was established in 2007, and as you know, uh, it also hosts a very successful master's program. Both the center and the program are very important to the anthropology department at SOAS. The center and its work is admired by other institutions in the UK and elsewhere. But importantly at SOAS, it's also been a beacon of critical scholarship. Ruba has hosted bold and cutting edge debate this year, which has been vitally important to all of us, although not all of us have participated in it with the enthusiasm that we should have done, frankly, I now realize. I think Ruba has taken the measure 
the pulse of where we are. And in many ways, the work of the center has been far ahead of other parts of SOAS in understanding the climate of what it means to live in London this year. So the center's hosted seminars on waiting, waiting both in Marseille and Bosnia, discussions on veiling, discussions on white privilege and do Black Lives Matter. And for those of you who are at SOAS, you'll know how important these things currently are on our campus. For those of you who are not at SOAS, you'll realize how important these things are for the world more generally. So in essence, under Ruba's leadership, the center has been pioneering, has taken a pulse that lots of other people have not even acknowledged. And it's Ruba's passion and hard work that has carried the center so successfully through this year. And you might think, well, why is Ed going on about Ruba? The lecture is all about Professor Hajj. And of course it is, but, and he is our guest. Um, but Ruba is going to talk about our speaker. I want to publicly acknowledge Ruba's promotion to professorship uh, in an environment where there's a large audience. Thank you very much which is uh, really an acknowledgement of all of the hard work that Ruba has put into this center and to other endeavors at SOAS over the years. Her own hard work is obviously reflected in her publications, but I think importantly in bringing 110 people together on a Wednesday morning, which is a fantastic achievement. Ruba, my personal thanks and appreciation for having done this. Uh, and I hope the rest of you have a wonderful morning and thank you Professor Hajj for joining us and for um, delivering an annual lecture for us. So Ruba if you're not too embarrassed I'll now hand it back to you. Thank you very much Ed. I, this is totally impromptu so <laughs> I'm very moved by your words and uh, recognition and I'm very thankful. I also am equally very thankful to um, uh, Professor Hassan Haj for accepting to interrupt his uh, very well earned sabbatical and most important activities <laughs> that we can all follow on his very prolific uh, blog and uh, social media to uh, deliver the annual lecture of uh, the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies. And um, it is obviously my great pleasure to now introduce you to Professor Hassan Haj, although differently from me, Hassan needs no introduction. Um, Hassan Haj is the University of Melbourne's future generation professor of anthropology and social theory and a fellow of the Australian Academy of the Humanities. He is widely known for his pathbreaking work on the enduring presence of race and its associated forms of white nationalism and white entitlements. The idea as he very cogently expresses in his book that if you are not doing well and you're white, your expectation is that you are entitled to do better because you are white. Um, his earlier writings reflect on the experience of nationalism, racism, and multiculturalism among white Australians, particularly in his book, White Nation, Fantasies of White Supremacy in a Multicultural Society, which was published in 1998, uh, where Hassan explores the desire and fantasy for a white nation penetrating even the most liberal Western ideals and imaginaries as well as their political economies. Rassan has also written on the political dimensions of critical anthropology, focusing on how critical anthropological thought can generate new problematics that pertain the realm and action of radical politics. His insights on the relationship between critical thinking, radical politics and anthropology are elaborated upon in his masterful book, Alter Politics, Critical Anthropology and the Radical Imagination. Rassan's most re recent publication, Is Racism an Environmental Threat?, takes on a very fruitful interrogation on the intersection between racism and the ecological crisis. Rassan has also, most importantly for this context even, provided scholars of diaspora and migration studies with what I think are the most insightful lens to understand the policies, the imaginaries of migration and the exclusionary um, dynamics um, around it. Ideas of weighthood, stuckedness as an existential condition, the ideas of migration and its counter as mobility envy, 
have really deeply changed the way we think about migration and migration regimes. As a public intellectual, as an active blogger, as a public commentator and social media um, user, Hassan also contributes to inform our everyday with thought-provoking reflections on contemporary uh, crises. Hassan has just completed his latest manuscript, which is an ethnographic reflection on the transnational culture of the Lebanese diaspora. And I believe the lecture today draws upon this uh, latest work. And so we are so excited, Hassan, to, to have you. As um, uh, Ed has mentioned, it's 8 p.m. in Melbourne today. So a particular added thank, thank you to you for um, uh, not only accepting this invitation, but accepting this invitation as a at a very late uh, time in the day. So without further ado, Hassan, the floor is yours. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Roba. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the Center for Migration and Diaspora Studies and uh, the Department of Anthropology uh, and Sociology for, for this invitation. Uh, it is true that uh, I'm on a very extended long, uh, long service leave and uh, this in fact is the first academic thing I do this year. This is how seriously I'm taking <laughs> my, uh, my leave. Uh, so this is the first presentation so the last few days were uh, going through uh, the book that I have handed in by the end of last year, uh, which is called The Diasporic Condition. And uh, this is coming out with University of Chicago Press, uh, probably uh, around October this year. And the lecture on diasporic anisogamy, although there is a chapter in the book called Diasporic Anisogamy, but the actual concept of diasporic anisogamy is quite central throughout throughout the book for my for the approach that I'm developing for the study of diaspora. So, uh, so in a way, I'd be wanting to take you take you for 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 a trip throughout the whole uh, publication. I mean, it is a book which has uh, literally taken about 25 years. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's, so it has taken 20, exactly almost 25 years of ethnographic work and uh, on and off of course and from variety of, of uh, perspectives and uh, it has changed in many ways but I want because it's such an involved uh, book it's almost like a PhD thesis I feel I feel talking about it like it's a PhD thesis you know when when students have just finished the PhD thesis, I, and I, I know it, it happens all the time, and I remember for myself, like it's very hard to take one thing without wanting to say, blah, 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 I want to talk about everything that I have written, so you, because if you don't understand everything that I've written, you will never understand this particular point, this kind of, uh, so there is this kind of feeling in me uh, that I have to get you through everything in the book in order to, for you to appreciate what I'm trying to, to achieve in, uh, with the concept of uh, an isogamy. But I won't, I promise. <laughs> However, I want to introduce a couple of uh, key, if you like, outlooks that I develop in the book as a kind of like way, way of of telling you how to approach, how I'm approaching the concept and how I hope you will approach, approach looking at it because it's quite experimental in, in some ways. First thing, the first thing I want to say is that I do make 
a very serious break with, uh, I wouldn't say all, definitely not, because I have used some, some scholarship, but I, will, I make a break with the dominant scholarship on uh, migration and diaspora, to the extent that I feel that this scholarship is always um, issue directed. It is always interested in migrants as a problem or not themselves being problem as having problems. Uh, so there's, uh, you know, you can be studying uh, migration from a governmental perspective and uh, the government of the country where migrants left and say, there's a brain drain issue. I want to study the problem of brain drain as I'm studying migration. Or you can study it from the perspective of the government of the receiving country and say, the economics of migration, are they, are they useful economically? Are they not? Uh, uh, study the process of cohesion, study, study sort of like questions of integration, etc. But you can also study it from the perspective of the migrants themselves and say, you know, migrants are subjected to racism. I want to study racism. I want to study marginalization. I want to study uh, uh, sort of like uh, over exploitation. Now, I'm not going to do any of this in this book. I don't do any of this in this book. In fact, I work very hard on not working on racism and not working on governmental problems. I work very hard on not being uh, supportive of the oppressed migrant, uh, etc. Now, I hope uh, for some, of, for those of you who know my work, I hope you take it for granted that it's not because I don't think these issues are important. Uh, obviously, I've written a lot about this, but I am, in a way, partly um, experimenting with, I would say, counterintuitively, a pure science of social science of diaspora. I know that now. I know there isn't such a thing as pure social science uh, of diaspora, and I am attempting, nevertheless. Uh, to do something I don't believe in and I don't believe exist, <laughs> but I am, this is how I'm tending and wishing myself to be. I think partly I feel, and I don't know if you experience it the same way I do, but I feel there is a slight over politicization of scholarship at the moment uh, in relation to migration, diaspora, uh, etc. I think uh, as there is uh, a, a loss of any uh, measured attempt at thinking the difference between scholarship and politics and where the two meet and where the two don't meet. There's a lot more about where they meet, but there's some people who think that they go together. Uh, it reminds me a bit of the phase in Marxism when Althusser wrote that philosophy was class struggle in theory. And so everyone who was philosophizing thought they were doing class struggle. And today, everyone who is writing all kinds of things uh, think they are engaging in anti-racism, anti-colonialism. Uh, etc. And I often feel that this is the scholarship is measured according to how anti-racist it is and how anti-colonial uh, it is, which I don't mind, right? Right. Uh, but at the same time, I feel, as Bourdieu says, uh, you know, sometimes good politics produces very bad scholarship, uh, and. Uh, and vice versa. It's true that some good scholarship produces bad politics. <laughs> uh, but I want to acknowledge that there is a space where scholarship and politics don't go hand in hand. You know? And there is something which is specific to scholarship, uh, which one needs to think about. 
even when they are politically committed. So in this in this book, I kind of like, in a, in a way, I'm using the cultural capital I have for having written so much on racism that I can afford at least uh, some people not thinking of me as being uh, non-political, to be non-political. <laughs> uh, so this is a kind of like strategic maneuvering with my background, if you like. So that's that's uh, the first first thing I, I like you to, to 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 be oriented toward. The questions I'm asking myself come from a kind of like what is diaspora? Uh, what what is this Lab thing called the Lebanese diaspora? Uh, what are its properties? Uh, how do I uh, understand it best? What are its features? Uh, how is it lived? Uh, questions like this. But perhaps if there is one single uh, political dimension, it would be what I would call, as I called it in, in my book, alter politics. It is derived from a critical anthropological tradition. And it involves asking the question, in what way does what I'm studying widen my understanding of the possibilities and the plurality of modes of living and modes of existence? That is, you approach something by saying, in what way is what I'm studying capable of widening my horizon and giving me more knowledge about the plurality of the way people live their lives? This is what I consider a critical anthropological approach as opposed to a critical sociological approach, which is more interested in relations of power, domination, class, gender, etc. So obviously you will say I'll do both, but I'm trying to emphasize that anthropological question of can the study of diaspora give us access to other modes of existence? And how, how does it help us think uh, these uh, modes of existence? Now, this is the general orientation. So from there, there's a couple of other minor things I want to highlight, which, is, which are more in relation to how empirically I approach the topic. The first thing is that I take seriously the notion of a diasporic culture and diasporic life world. And I ask myself, what is a diasporic life world? Uh, how does the process of migration, uh, etc., uh, how do they create a diasporic life world? And a diasporic life world is clearly a transnational reality. Uh, all, for me, all the Lebanese who are uh, around the world, uh, etc., uh, who are still uh, form, have all kinds of attachments to Lebanon, etc., form uh, together what I call a transnational diasporic life world. So I'm taking as an object this transnational life world. It's, I'm not taking, I am not, and this is very crucial, I am not taking as my object the Lebanese culture and its transformation in the US or how you Lebanese adopt to adapt to living in Venezuela or I'm doing my field, I do, did my field work in Venezuela, in the US, in Europe, in uh, a bit in Brazil. Uh, so I, I followed Lebanese and Lebanese families in many places, but I wasn't really interested in how they adapted to Brazil, how they adapted to Venezuela, how they adapted. I was more interested in how they generated in their totality a diasporic culture. So I'm more interested in the relation they have among each other, if you like, and with Lebanon, 
and how they form this transnational uh, reality. There's a similar approach, obviously, in, in Nina, Nina Glickshiva's work in terms of transnational uh, uh, networks, but notice in Nina's work, the emphasis is on networks. Uh, and so the emphasis is much more on relations and socio sociological questions. I'm more interested in uh, uh, the question of culture and life world rather than just networks. So this is as broadly as I can, I can go. Now, first substantive departure. I treat diasporic culture as the culture of Lebanese modernity. I show in the book how Lebanese modernity emerges as a diasporic culture. That is, uh, in a sense, this is very crucial uh, because what it means is that there is no Lebanese modernity that is not diasporic. But it also means that diasporic culture is just as much in Lebanon as it is outside of Lebanon. So I don't define diaspora as being away from them. Diasporic culture is the culture of Lebanon as it was transformed by capitalism and took its form in uh, the making of Lebanese modernity. Now, you might say this is quite uh, sort of like how can one, so, so let, sorry, just let me sort of like be clear here. To say that Lebanese, that diaspora, diasporic culture is the culture of Lebanese modernity is to say that even if you haven't migrated, you, can, you are part of diasporic culture. Uh, and that's crucial. And, uh, but what is the relation between migration and diaspora? is very uh, complex because take in Australia, we have beach cultures and beach cultures often emerged as a result of the practice of surfing. In fact, many of the beaches emerged and became beach now, uh, beach, cultural town because of the practice of surfing. So you can say that historically this beach culture could not have become, could not be possible without surfing. But you wouldn't say today that only if you are a surfer can you be part of the beach culture. In fact, you can participate in beach culture without ever surfing. You might not have that much cultural capital, but you still can be part of a beach culture without surfing. Likewise, you can say that a diaspora migration as a practice was crucial for the formation of diasporic culture. But it doesn't mean that you have to have, today, you have to have had some experience of migration to be part of diasporic culture. So let me quickly say two features about what I consider a diasporic, make diasporic culture what it is, and that can help us understand the concept that I want to develop of any zone. The so first thing I became interested in was what I called the internationalization of the space of viability. The internationalization of the space of viability. What I mean by this is that as capitalism emerged in Lebanon, people started to have 
a consciousness of the world as a place where they can make a living. Now you might think that's not much, but it is for me an incredible experience. You have to think about it. What does it mean when at one point in history, a Lebanese villager, if you know Lebanese villages, they are often in the mountains, they have a long history of autarchy. They are, the mountains are not sort of like in 17th, 18th century, they are sort of like nested in the mountains. So people did not think their viability. What I mean, how do I make my life a viable life? They didn't think their viability outside of the confines of the territory where they existed. Soon as they started thinking their viability, maybe in terms of going to the coast, etc. But what I'm interested in is the emergence of a point where a Lebanese villager got, gets up and says, maybe, maybe I'm going to make a living in Halifax. I heard there's a place called Halifax. I'm going to go to Halifax. Uh, I'm going to go to Queensland. Have you ever heard of this place called Queensland in Australia, which is now think about it. I mean, like it's quite an incredible thing. This is not about consciousness of the world, right? Be very clear about it because a consciousness of the existence of the world existed long ago. What I'm talking about is the emergence of a consciousness that I can go and throw myself and invest myself, as Bourdieu would say, invest myself. That is, try and see how I will go in life by going to Canada, by going to Brazil, by going, etc. It's a very peculiar state of consciousness because unlike other migrations, it did not follow a colonial route. So it's not that a Lebanon was colonized by the French, the Lebanese went to Paris uh, or went to, to, to France. So it's not like Algerian migration or like the most common uh, mode of, of uh, thinking so the Indian migration to, uh, to, to the UK, this kind of stuff, no? there was nothing directional about it. It was, okay, the world is there and let's look for a place where we can make a living in the world. Now, for me, this is an amazing uh, thing, sort of an amazing transformation of uh, one's consciousness. So I spent quite a bit of time in a book analyzing the meaning of this uh, transformation. And now we come closer to the question of anisogamy, a corollary of this consciousness of existing in an international space where I can go and make a living is uh, a comparative consciousness. Uh, comparative consciousness involves the idea that slowly and surely you start being unable to think of one thing without thinking, oh, maybe, 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 shall I go to university in Beirut? Or well, actually, maybe I should go to France. Oh no, maybe I should go to England or maybe I should go to the UK. Uh, but before that, even if I'm going hawking, maybe I'm gonna go to Brazil, maybe I'm gonna go to, 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 to the US. And I've got a lot of uh, sort of like instances where some privileged people, it's not always the case, but some privileged people interact with their migration 
like people in a lolly shop. Oh, where shall I go? Maybe I should go to Brazil. Maybe I should go to, 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 to the US. I've got uh, a brother, a brother in Australia. Uh, I've got uh, a son in France. Where shall I go? And every day I change my mind. So this idea is that where, where, where will we go? But it involves comparison. This comparative logic becomes an integral part of diasporic consciousness today such as, and the cases that I uh, spent quite a bit of time uh, thinking through is, so, you know, uh, just give you a short, uh, quick story, uh, anecdotal uh, thing from the book. Uh, this guy was getting uh, sort of like a bit, like mockingly, not, not seriously, but uh, in a jokey manner, getting stuck into his Lebanese wife, he's an American Irish, and he's stuck, he took his wife to, uh, to, to, to uh, the Grand, Grand Canyon and she looked in front of the Grand Canyon and she said, this reminds me of Wadi Kadisha, which is uh, uh, some kind of sort of like a big valley uh, in Lebanon. And so he starts saying, what the hell is this? Every time I take you somewhere, you cannot just look at it. It tells, it reminds you of, it reminds you of. And uh, his, there was another couple and they were started joking, all of them about how every time you take a Lebanese somewhere, that it reminds them of Lebanon, even though Lebanon is only a couple of square meters. So that was sort of like saying, I mean, how many places on earth can be replicated in Lebanon inside two square camps. So, so they were making a joke about this comparative logic. But besides the joke, there's something very interesting here because it means that you cannot see a space which is not superposed to another space. This is what I mean by the comparative. Once you are gripped by diasporic consciousness, you can never see one thing. You always see something and something else you compare it with. And this uh, state of consciousness has become, I think, uh, generalized today. It's no longer very specific to, to diaspora, but its or, diasporic origin is very, uh, very important uh, and clear. And so, so I spent quite a bit of time analyzing this logic, this comparative logic, and this is the comparative logic that take us to the question of uh, anisogamy. Why? And what, in what sense, and what is the relation between comparative logic and uh, anisogamy, and what is anisogamy? This is what we're, we're going to, to investigate now. So the first thing is that take one of the main uh, sort of like social phenomena where comparative logic presents itself is in, uh, uh, in diasporic, in feelings, sorry, I'm losing a common word here, sort of like uh, nostalgia. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the nostalgia and nostalgic logic is ex itself very comparative. Uh, sort of like, ah, what am I doing here? I should be there. And so it's always a here, there, uh, sort of like dimension uh, to nostalgia. Now, when people treat nostalgia, they almost treat it as if it's some kind of a uh, disease or not necessarily disease because I don't want to imply that people treat it as something bad. It's more that they treat it as something that happens to people when they migrate. They can't help it. Uh, if you are uh, a migrant, you get nostalgic. And nostalgia is a symptom of, if you like, it's a symptom of uh, migration. Now, what I want to start 
sort of like introduced in you too, and which I develop a lot in bank, is the fact that nostalgia is strategic. Uh, that it is not as innocently just a feeling I have. That in fact, there are certain uh, social uh, forces and etc., which lead you to be more or less nostalgic, uh, and that your nostalgia is often directed towards something. It is not just a feeling that you have. Let me go back to the example I started with when we were saying the woman was looking at the Grand Canyon and she said, it reminds me of where the addition. Now you can see this as an innocent comparison, but there's more to it than that because I want to argue that what she is also saying is to her husband who is American, she is saying to him, well, your country has the Grand Canyon, but my country has Wadi Kadisha. That is, you, your country has offered me this, but my country offers something else. That is, it becomes a competitive giftedness here. Sure, you can give me Grand Canyon, but don't think that I'm gonna look at the Grand Canyon and say, oh my God, it's so amazing. Thank you so much for making me experience the Grand Canyon because if it wasn't for the Grand Canyon, my life would be so deprived of valleys and etc. Who do you think you are? My country has bloody great valleys and I am telling you, you're not showing me much. My country has enough. So now this is what I call an isogamic logic. What is an isogamic logic? An isogamic logic is when you have a relation between two parties where there is a hint of inequality that is happening and where there's a need for a labor of valorization to maintain the relation. All these words are important. The labor of valorization. Now, anisogamy in classical usage in Levi-Strauss is marriage or reciprocity between two people of unequal status or two groups of unequal status. And now the first thing when Levi Source was doing it, sort of like thinking it, it was not an object of controversy, which had the high status, which had the low status. So like, so, but you know, if today an American might think he's high status and, a Lebanese, and the Lebanese low status, but that doesn't, doesn't mean the Lebanese is gonna accept that high, American is high status. So the highness or lowness of the status is itself a, uh, an object of struggle in an anisogamic relation. It's not accepted who has the high culture, who has the but there is something fundamental in all the interviews that I made, in all the observations, which has sometimes this high culture, low culture has to do with racism, uh, sort of like developmentalism. I'm from an advanced developed country, you are from, uh, from a sort of like a third world country, not, not industrially developed. So sometimes there is this kind of relation. But one of the things that interested me was that there was hints, even though Lebanese do not shy away, I'm generalizing here, of course, there's wonderful Lebanese and awful Lebanese, but some Lebanese are very racist in Venezuela, for instance, or in, uh, in Africa, and they're just colonially racist. Uh, so it's not that they feel uh, in a developmental capitalist with the modernist sense that they are uh, the lower status uh, part of the equation when they are in Venezuela. And yet 
I invariably noticed that there were moments where there was a sense of inferiority. And I'm cutting a very long story short here, but I came to the point where it became very clear to me that at the basis of this is this idea that I come from a country that could not keep me. I come from a country that could not keep me. So I might be uh, in, in, in Venezuela, I might be in Brazil, I might be in Uruguay, I might be in the US, it doesn't matter. So still the fact is, I come from a country which could not cater for me. And it is because of this that I am here. And so this is where the language becomes very interesting because you find sometimes metaphors of adoption, sometimes metaphors of marriage, sometimes metaphors of simply sort of like exchange, but always there is this sense that the host country has offered something, either in marriage or by adopting or by uh, etc. Now, in this process of exchange, you get a classic and isogamic situation. Now, what is the classic and isogamic situation? Take, I give you a kind of like a schematic example from a Lebanese village. Uh, a guy marries, marries well, that is, he married a woman whose family is economically better off, let's say. So they're married. Her family are rich, his family are poor, or even just status. Now, the woman has no interest in her husband coming and saying publicly something like, I am so grateful for so-and-so to have married me. She has pulled me out of my lowly family and has positioned me in her family. In fact, her wife, his wife would not like him to do this because to be down on your own background reflects on her. And also people have to ask her, why is it that you've married someone from lesser status? She has an interest in him valorizing his background. And he has to also say, so, you know, I've got a situation where people say, oh, they don't say like his father is uneducated. They don't say his father is uneducated, they say, his father sort of like is very, very entrepreneurial. He's gone and opened the cafe in Sikha and they avoid talking about education. So there's strategies of valorization that happen. You valorize the lower party. But now the interesting thing is that the lower party that comes into the equation has to learn not to trespass. That is, there's a point where self-valorization becomes real lack of gratitude. And you don't want to get to the point where you want to say, well, who the hell do you think you are? You know, have you forgotten where I'm taking you? That is, you have to learn to valorize yourself, valorize your work, know the limits of where self-valorization becomes lack of gratitude. And also the, the superior party has to learn not to just put its superiority 
want the person in superiority and know how to do it. So it is a very interesting, subtle, strategic game and is organic relations. They are very interesting because here inequality is not something that needs to be abolished. It's not some kind of like, uh, you know, it's not some kind of like uh, activist approach to inequality. Oh no, there's inequality here. How, how are we going to abolish it? No, this is an unequal relation. Each party is trying to seek their viability without grand political activism, just sort of like moving between how to valorize oneself, how to valorize the other, and how to operate within uh, this space. So, so when immigrants go to a space, They often expect valorization, which never happens. So the Lebanese, for instance, uh, often start engaging in self-valorization as a kind of substitute for an expected valorization from the host state, which never comes. So it's a bad anisogamic relation, if you like, often, especially migrants in the West, because the Western states and the Western population don't play the game of, oh, I valorize you, or I'm, I'm having a good relation with you. No, on the contrary, they throw the status, low, their, their understanding of the low status of the person in their face. And so the person is left with having to engage in strategies of self-valorization. And, and often this self-valorization is gendered. Now, this is where it becomes very interesting. That is the imaginary of it is gendered. That is the stories always take the shape of, but Lebanon is a great place. Lebanon is a great mother. It's, the father that mucked up the mother. That's why my mother had to leave me. So, like, it takes the form, Lebanon's country, sort of like the nature in Lebanon is so beautiful, or Lebanon people are so lovely, and they love each other, if it wasn't for the state, uh, etc. So the state is always kind of like the male who fails to look after the woman, which made the woman forced to abandon her children. And so when, when the migrant goes to other places, they start playing this process of valorizing the mother country and blaming the father country for the problems of the mother country. That is saying, sure, Lebanon is a bloody great place and I wouldn't leave it if it wasn't for blah, 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 blah. Uh, lousy politics, lousy stuff. Sometimes it is nature versus people, you know. It's, it takes variety, but the structure allows for, you know, I mean, I mean like there's this joke which, like it's one of those jokes which every probably every people every country people in the country say it about but like so it's so, sort of like what, what it goes something like when god created lebanon uh, the countries around were very jealous I said, how did you create a country that's so beautiful, the nature is so lovely, etc., and made us so ugly uh, around you? So God said, you know, you're right. So he created the Lebanese. And that's the idea is that sort of like here, nature is lovely and says that the people are bad. Uh, it's the similar structure of the mother's good, nature's good, etc. Uh, the active part is bad, the organizing principle is bad, uh, uh, the law is bad, uh, the principle behind the law is bad, 
but uh, they say uh, they say Khamra Taibi, that is the essence of the place, it's lovely. It's just the others who are mucking it up. And so these are all what I call anisogamic strategies of valor valorization. And, and, and nostalgia is part of this. When people offer nostalgia, it's not an innocent feeling. A kind of like often the intensity of nostalgia, etc., is linked to these anisogamic uh, dynamics. Uh, the more you don't valorize me, the more I'm going to yearn for where I come from. Uh, the more I don't realize myself, uh, the more. I'm going to uh, get stuck into it. But there is also often a kind of like a quasi uh, refusal to accept on the part of migrants any, any sense of uh, gratitude for uh, the people living, for the people where they are uh, migrating to because of the bad nature of this uh, and his organ. Like, I know, I know the case of this Lebanese guy here in Australia, who is seriously like a serious reactionary uh, guy politically. Uh, I mean, I've known him for a long time and he's a friend of the family. And he's kind of like, uh, like he's racist towards indigenous people in a kind of like seriously unreconstructed, unconscious way, sort of like, you know, he, he says things like this all the time, sort of like uh, black, inferior, etc. Anyway, uh, and then out of the blue, we were talking about, we were talking about uh, so, 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 uh, you should be thankful for the Australia, for Australian to have welcomed you in, in, in Australia. He said, why should I be thankful for them welcoming me? They don't own the country. Australia is an indigenous place. Australia always will, always will be. Well, suddenly he's turned into a radical assertion, asserting indigenous, indigenous sort of like power in Australia. And I was looking amazed and it was very easy for him to say this in order not to say, I want to be thankful towards white Australians for having, having accepted me. I can't, nothing, anything is better than saying that uh, kind of like uh, in a way. Now, it's very interesting this, this kind of like how because the host does not valorize the incomer, then it unleashes a negative dialectic where the incomer never, never uh, valorizes uh, the host and the host in turn turns more so it becomes a negative dialectic, which is the very essence of a bad and isogamic relation. When, uh, the, and uh, in the book I've got uh, a case uh, of a guy who migrates uh, to the US and marries his cousin. And his cousin is richer than him. And most of his problems came from the fact that he could not cope with the fact that his uncle's family looked down on him. And he turned it into a question of migration, uh, country from one country to another, even though it was clear it wasn't the migration from the US, from Lebanon to the US, that was the source of uh, his suffering, but the anisogamic relation he had with his, uh, with his cousin. Now, so, Anisogamy means that one needs to look at how expressions of attachment 
to the host country and more the attachment to the country of origin all are part of a negotiated relation with the host country. So they're not just, I don't get just nostalgic and express nostalgia just because I'm feeling nostalgic. I, I might feel nostalgic, but how I, how I express it and the intensity with which I express it and to whom, uh, all of these are part of a, uh, an isogamic logic. But the most important part of an isogamy that I treat in the book doesn't have to do really with logic. It has to do with what I uh, call, uh, which is another uh, crucial dimension of diasporic uh, life world that I examine in the book, what I call uh, uh, the lenticular condition. Now, so len lenticular, L-E-N-T-I-C-U-L-A-R, lenticular condition. Now, <coughs> I'm just going to briefly introduce you to what lenticular condition means so I can develop more fully that question of valorization and anisogamic valorization. At the heart, at the heart of folk understanding of the migrant experience is always a form of what I call monorealism, which is the idea that you can only be in one place. So I am looking at the Grand Canyon, I'm in the US. I remember the valley in Lebanon. You can only be in one place and remember another place. So when you are engaging in comparison, the assumption is always it's a comparison between a lived space and a remembered place. And this is what I kind of like try to quite, I like to think as systematically as possible, destroy. <laughs> Uh, in in the book, this accepting this idea that you can only inhabit one place and you remember the other place. Uh, and that question of memory is always sort of like, you know, in memory studies, in nostalgia, it's always about memory. How do you remember memory, memory, memory? memory. So, uh, with the notion of memory, there is the highlight of a relation to the past. But in diaspora, it's not always the comparison is not just with the past, because the comparison is also with another place. So, what does it mean when you are nostalgic to another place? I mean, we all know that like the classic things that we take them for granted that migrants, when they migrate, uh, they leave a place and they think that it is still as it is, uh, sort of like even though it is changing, but they don't think it's changing. And, and scholars always mix time and space and see, see, them, see them together. But it's very interesting because no one asks the question, well, what actually does it mean to inhabit a space as opposed to remembering a place? And what are the technical criteria which make us accept that here you have inhabitants, here you have remembrance? So there's this woman in Montreal, she was talking about her grandmother. She said, who lives in Montreal. And she said, you know, she goes to the Lebanese shopkeepers. She only buys Lebanese grocery. 
she lives as if she is in Lebanon. And I became interested with the notion of as if. That is, she was talking about her grandmother and she was certain that her mother lived in Montreal. But she lived as if she was in Lebanon. Now, what I subjected to a kind of like analytical, microanalytic lens was more the question of well, why, what does it mean to inhabit Montreal as opposed to as if, not really inhabiting Lebanon, but acting as if you are inhabiting Lebanon. So what's the difference between the relationship this woman had with Montreal and the relationship she had uh, with Lebanon? Now, you might think, come on, like, it's very simple. She is in Montreal <laughs> and she's not in Lebanon. Let's not play silly games and uh, et cetera, and be matter of fact about it. But I, I want to convince you that it's not so straightforward at all, actually. I mean, it's uh, actually in anthropology, it's a classic, classical problem of place when I say I did my ethnography in uh, Papua New Guinea, as I said, well, where I did it in uh, Highland, well, where, uh, so where, where were you located? What did you inhabit? What is the place you are actually referring to? So I say, I'm in Sydney. Some of you are in London, some of you are in Netherlands. I can see some people from all over Europe here. Yes, it's wonderful. Uh, and uh, I say, okay, and we are also on the net. So we are occupying a multiplicity of spaces. We are occupying the space of the net, a virtual space, and we are occupying uh, our rooms. Uh, now, but what interests me is when we say, so I'm in Sydney, I am inhabiting Sydney, which is, by the way, Ruba, I am, I live in Sydney, not in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and now, what does it mean that I'm in Sydney? Uh, where? I mean, I'm not in Sydney. Sydney is huge, like every other place. Uh, I'm actually in my land room, uh, in uh, a suburb called Glimp. Uh, and so how, how do we say I am in a space and confidently say, so I am in Australia, but not in Lebanon. But why? Uh, on what basis? Obviously, I am not everywhere in Australia, let alone I am definitely, uh, I am not everywhere in New South Wales, I'm not everywhere in Sydney, I'm not even everywhere inside my house. I'm not even everywhere in, in, on the first floor, right? But so what are the combinations of actual experience and imaginative experience that combine together to create the statement, I am in, I say, I am in Sydney. Sure, I went to the pool, uh, so I remember that I drove along a certain road uh, and every day, so I have a memory of the places I've been going to on an everyday basis. And I have an immediate relation with uh, the paintings uh, here and uh, my partner is having a gin and tonic because I'm boring her to hell uh, in the background there. And uh, so I can relate to all these things that position me confidently. <laughs> Uh, my partner saying that she finished the gin and tonic. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
And I can confidently, on the basis of certain things I remember, certain things I'm confident exist around me, certain things like this, say I am in Sydney, which is in Australia. Now, you can't see it here, but I have actually a photo of my father, and I've got a couple of mementos that I've got from Lebanon. And they remind me of Lebanon. Now, when I relate to these directly, do I say, I remember Lebanon, I'm not in Lebanon, why? Why do I say, I remember Lebanon and I am in Sydney? Why not say that I am in Sydney and I am in Lebanon? I'm not inhabiting Lebanon in the same way I'm inhabiting Sydney. No one is saying to inhabit has to be the same way. But to, when do we say that I am inhabiting a space on the basis of relation to certain things and the remembrance of other things? Now, the same process is involved with me saying, so, so what I'm inviting you to think is that we inhabit multiplicity of spaces. Rather than think simply in inhabiting one place and remembering other places, I'm inviting you to think in terms of multiple inhabitants and different types of inhabitants. So no one is saying, obviously, that I am in Sydney in the same way I'm in Lebanon. Now, what is interesting is that a lot of the data I've got reflects people who say I am in two places. I'm thinking, they say I am here and I, you know, also I am here, I'm also there. You know, my sort of like I'm occupied, I'm doing this, I'm doing that here and I'm doing that there. Like people don't actually always say, I'm, now, I'm not trying to dissuade you from saying there are such a thing as memories, but I'm saying that the question of remembering a place does not capture the totality of the experience. Like, we are too often letting memory do the work by creating an opposition between inhabiting and remembering, instead of trying to think multiple inhabitants and different modes of inhabitants. And, and once we start thinking this way, we start seeing that we are, and we can, and we do often inhabit a multiplicity of spaces. Differently, but we do. And so, person is sitting in their large room like me, whatever the immediate material reality they, that are there, they are relating to is the first raw material. Then they use the imaginary to think themselves as inhabiting this place or inhabiting that place. When I was in the US, this guy was showing me his new house and he was holding the baby. And he was a total Elvis, Elvis freak. And he had part of his lounge room, totally kind of like from Graceland, kind of like all kind of Elvis memorabilia, uh, uh, you know, everything, posters, uh, chairs, uh, cushions, everything and you turn to the to the left and there's a, a bar which has a Lebanese cedar and a uh, Lebanese hookah and a shirim uh, for making kibbe and it looked and he said and he said to me he said look he was holding his baby like this and he said look this is my America talking that, to the eldest part of the language. And this is Lebanon. And when he said that, 
his baby went, ah, sort of like, like this. And he said to his baby, yes, see, America, Lebanon, America, Lebanon. <laughs> and uh, in a way, uh, that is what I'm trying to convey with the notion of lenticular reality. Lenticular, now lent, the lenticular is actually a photo photographic technique. These are those photos which, uh, when you flick them, you see they can contain more than one photo. You know, you flick them, so you see sort of like Jesus, Mary, uh, uh, before, after, frowning clowns, uh, smiling clown, you know, you flick them. So they, they contain two, two photos in one and they, the, their reality flicker, they flicker. This is, this is what I call lenticular reality. And what I'm trying to convey to you is that diasporic reality is a lenticular reality. People are continuously inhabiting a multiplicity of realities and they flicker. I'm not just in, in Australia, I'm in Australia and I, Lebanon is constantly flickering. And I personally, I'm talking here, but I, I mean in the book, I, I produce a lot of data to uh, show how this actually works all the time. Uh, not exclusively, I'm not trying, remember, I'm not trying to abolish the concept of remembering. <laughs> it's just that I feel that it monopolizes the imagination and stops us from thinking the possibility of multiple inhabitants rather than thinking that one inhabits one reality and remembers all the time. There is such a thing as multiple inhabitants, simultaneous, right? Because in migration studies, there are multiple inhabitants, but it's people who move from one place to another. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about simultaneously inhabiting realities, multiple realities. So, so this, this now uh, is what I move to try and develop my understanding of an isogamic valorization. Because what I argue is that, and yeah, is valorization is not simply a kind of like intellectual exercise. Valorization is what I call a process of intensifying reality. That is, you vote by attaching yourself more to one reality of another reality. You vote by, you don't, you don't valorize, you don't valorize Lebanon by saying, always, but just by saying, oh, my country is beautiful. You valorize Lebanon in the face of wanting to devalorize the US by living, inhabiting Lebanon more intensely, even though you are living in the US, but you inhabit Lebanon more intensely. That is, anisogamy becomes a game of intensification and strategic intensification. You intensify the real, one reality at the expense of another reality in order to say, I am not invest, as invested in this reality. I'm going to invest myself more in this reality because it's more rewarding. I don't want to be suffering you and your racism, etc. I'm going to, to live here. And in fact, when I interviewed the grandmother who was living in Montreal and as if living, living in Lebanon, she gave me this amazing tale of how she never wanted to travel to Montreal, to, to Canada, and her husband sort of like forced her to, to come. And uh, she was, she told me a whole story about how she was part of the first book club in the village. And then when she moved to Montreal, she started working in the shop with her husband and never managed to read anymore. And so she gave me a kind of like misery tale. Uh, and she was saying, Ah, yeah, we made a lot more money, but I, I, I did not read anymore, and etc. And so she created two worlds. 
a world of satisfaction and emotion and a world of uh, money making, which is often the division that they make uh, in this process. Like the two spaces, one, one space embodies affect, uh, love, and so on. One space uh, in starts embodying uh, more instrumental uh, money making uh, logic. So much so that actually I got a wonderful information from rereading Marcel Moss on double morphology. I don't know if you know this text, but the Marcel Moss in double morphology is a study of Eskimos. It's a study of Eskimos and the study of society in Eskimos. They have two inhabitants, but they don't inhabit them at the same time. However, what's interesting about Moss's study of this double morphology is that this tribe that he was studying, so they actually change their culture when they move. So when they're on, in, 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 in one season, when they are down, they are authoritarian, uh, sort of like rule abiding, etc. When they move to the other space in summer, they become libertarian. Uh, and so Morse analyzes how they exist in these two spaces, but not simultaneously. And so, I felt what I was analyzing was a kind of like simultaneous double morphology. So instead of you move in summer here and there, it's constantly with you. You are occupying constantly two spaces. And each space is invested with very different values. And you lean on one or the other as part of your strategic negotiation of uh, your relation. Uh, this is what uh, an isogamic sort of like strategizing. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Rassan. That was so um, really brilliant and brilliantly delivered with so many vivid examples um, that made your talk um, so really um, intense and uh, made it, I think, um, in a way that everyone can actually connect to what you're saying at, uh, at a very sort of individual level as well. So not only you're given, you, you have given us lots of thought for thought about uh, how to rethink the relationship between the migrant or, uh, and, and the host and the home societies in, in, in very interesting ways, but also I think that each one of us has had a moment where he or she identified <laughs> and, and, and felt very uh, personally about what you were talking about. Um, we have now time for um, questions and answers. I have lots and lots of comments and questions that I would like to ask you. I will just limit myself to one quest, to a couple of questions while the audience is gathering um, their thoughts. Um, the first one is that Obviously, I want to be uh, a little bit uh, um, the devil, <laughs> uh, the devil's advocate here, and want to come back to the issue you started your talk with uh, by taking distance from uh, a certain type of scholarship, which is uh, inscribing itself uh, in, in in a very political framework. Um, and um, and of course, you are more than legitimate to do so by virtue of your pedigree and by virtue of what you know what we know you have written and your engagement, your everyday engagement. But I was wondering to what extent this is actually so distant from the political. I think you're, what you're offering us is, is a very, um, it's obviously a, a really uh, fresh and important um, approach because it takes us back to one of your dear issues about this, you know, the fact that we are stuck together and we need to understand how to deal with this. And, uh, and people are constantly negotiating uh, their statuses, their, uh, their existences in all the kinds of interesting ways you mentioned. So in that sense, I think it's very refreshing to, to kind of zoom in and think about the everyday negotiations of individuals, of subjects who are part of histories, larger canvases, but they are every day 
making themselves um, at home in these in these multiple ways and negotiating with different imaginaries and spaces and places and and so on. To me, this is absolutely refreshing. But I'm wondering to what extent we can actually shy away from the political structural context in with in with in which these exchanges, these anisomic uh, negotiations happen. Yeah. And of course, you know, the, you know, the, I was just watching a movie the other day uh, in the uh, Royal Anthropology Film Festival, which I couldn't finish watching because it was too sad of a Palestinian refugee from um, uh, Shatil, one of the refugee camps in Beirut, who lives for Greece. It, the, the director is uh, Michel Fleifi, who's well known. Uh, yes. And, and this latest documentary shows the trajectory of these Palestinian refugees leaving the camp in Lebanon, the pl a place of hopelessness. Uh, of course, there are lots of negotiations happening every day. There isn't only hopelessness, but in general, in the long durée of things, it's a place of hopelessness. And adds up in Greece, where basically his possibility of engaging with anyone other than the other three Palestinians he's living with in a, in a damp place, is in the park where basically he resorts to, to become a sex worker. And the horizon is that he apparently then goes back to, to the camp because, you know, from one space of hopelessness to another. And I'm, I was just wondering what kind of anisopic, anison, an, anison, uh, anisogamic, <laughs> yes. Uh, you would well, see. I mean, I think, kind of uh, yeah. So, so okay. I'm I mean, to I, what extent, I'll just finish. I'm wondering to what extent so this is very useful to analyze and understand long-term diasporic communities, such as the Lebanese, who enjoy also certain types of status and, and so on and so forth. And I, I think you, you know, you obviously um, probably agree with me and, 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 but I just want, I felt the need to say this. Yeah. yeah. And, um, um, I mean, I think I think it's. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think it's crucial that I'm not dealing with refugees here. One, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm not dealing with refugees. Uh, you know, I mean, to to the extent that you can extrapolate the study of the Lebanese diaspora to study in elements of refugees, I mean, that's that would be for your own creative uh, encounter with your own empirical empirical uh, sort of like uh, relation. So, so I, I definitely don't want to claim some. Uh, mega universalism <laughs> uh, about what I what I am studying. I mean, I'm studying the Lebanese diaspora. I'm hoping that from that I can get some ideas about diaspora. But I'm yeah. I mean, uh, one needs to limit and also, but also uh, not just limit. You can I think you can use uh, definitely a ver variety of ways the notion of uh, anisogamy. But you will need to bend it, transform it to suit your own, I mean, I'm not offering formulas here. I'm just thinking my subject and, and be happy to see people uh, bend it and transform it and do other things. But I like, I mean, what would give me joy is people thinking creatively with it uh, and transforming it. But I would definitely not want to think it as a formula for analyzing all kinds of diasporas uh, around the world. But the question of the political too, uh, very quickly, I will want to say, I think I've ended up in a very political space, uh, very consciously, because what I want to argue is that, personally, I, I, I don't expect necessarily people to agree with me, but I think we academics are lousy politicians, <laughs> and we don't, we're not very good at politics, and yet everyone likes to do politics. And we are not good at politics. Uh, actually, our biggest political impact is when we concentrate on what we do best. And in a very funny way, we end up being much more efficiently political when we concentrate on being good academics, rather than try and play the politics of politicians uh, because I mean, you say, say, even the language that we take is position, position, that I have this position and you have this position. I mean, like, you can't do politics with positions. Uh, 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 anyway, yes, this is another, another, another conversation. But, but I, what I want to assert is that you don't escape the political, but by affirming the academic, 
you introduce into the political something new that instead of trying to mimic and reproduce an academic version of what politicians do, the job is to introduce something fresh from an academic perspective that can transform politics rather than mimic it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Rassan. This is uh, uh, a great point to actually to bring to this for, and I, I hope that uh, it will offer food for thoughts also for our students while they are thinking what kind of an academic will they become. If uh, and I think this is something that needs to be given a lot of a lot of um, attention. Um, but I think there are already lots of questions in the chat. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question directly to, to Hassan. If you want to, if not, we can read them out, but uh, it would be very nice to have an exchange. So please, uh, I can see Daniela, I can see Bella, Ellie Maria, please do unmute yourself. Sure, I can start uh, if that's okay. Sure. Hi, um, my name is Daniela George. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Coimbra here in Portugal, where it's sunny. <laughs> but um, thank you so much. This was a really interesting talk. Um, the question that I asked in the chat box was um, especially about diaspora communities that return and how in the reconciliation process between the imagined community and the construction of uh, the place of origin, uh, especially for second generation. And um, then when in the actual return, uh, trying to, I think there also emerges a similar to what Professor Hajj mentioned of the competitive nature of showing you do belong, but you are different. And I just wanted to ask about this. How, how does this work within that same, um, with that same logic? I, well, I'm not sure I understood very well, sort of like the nature of your question. Can you can you repeat it in a different way, perhaps? Mm, okay. So, uh, for uh, can can I use an example? So, for example, I yeah. am a Portuguese American, and I grew up in a Portuguese community, much like those you described of Lebanese communities outside of uh, of Lebanon. And I have yeah. returned returned to Portugal, and there's also a new negotiation. You know, because I have grown up in a context where um, where Portugal, for example, was constructed in a specific way within the community of Newark, for example, where I where I grew up and the reconciliation of coming back, you know, and it not being the same culture that was produced outside within the diaspora. Um, yeah. yeah, the differentiation between that. Yes, yes. I mean, it's very, uh, it's very interesting to look at, uh, I mean, like to just give you a sense of the difference in Lebanon from uh, what you are describing here, which, are, which may, might be the same, but you tell me, you can tell me. But, I mean, there's always this imaginary that the place people migrate from is monocultural and the place people go to is multicultural. That, so the village in Lebanon apparently has Lebanese culture and when people go to the world they become part of a multiplicity of culture. Now what's interesting about when people come back to a Lebanese village is that the Lebanese village is a microcosm of the world. First of all, uh, the names of people, people are called Jose, George, uh, Louis. So uh, they have American names, they have Brazilian names. These are the people living in Lebanon, right? Like, because people name after migrants, especially after successful migrants. So like if Carlos, uh, Carlos, uh, and that did really well, suddenly you get a wave of people called Carlos, 
it's, uh, it's actually something I treat uh, in the book because it's a kind of like successful migrants are considered like saints of migration. Uh, because the migrant who does well embodies an essence and it's like saints. If you name after the saint, maybe you will get a little bit of their baraka and, and you, will, you will become successful. So like, likewise, because Selma Hayek became uh, a kind of like uh, successful sort of like lots of girls are called Selma. Uh, so you have multiplicity of names, uh, but also you have like, actually the first time I went to the village, uh, the mayor took me on a tour of what they call villas. Villa, and they say, this villa is Saudi, this villa is Venezuelan, this villa is Brazilian. That is, they name each villa according to the remittance money which has uh, produced them. And then you have uh, the Caracas Clinic, uh, you have uh, a Saudi financed football field. Uh, so, so the whole village, the microcosm, of and multiplicity, but not only names, I mean the accents, the accents of people. Uh, and so when the second generation uh, goes to Lebanon, this is what shocks them most uh, because they imagine they are going back to some kind of like pure monocultural, which never existed almost because Lebanese villages have been like this since uh, the end of the 18th century. Thank you, Hassan. There are um, several questions in the chat. So if you don't want to um, unmute yourself. Um, well, I'm trying to, to see how I get to the chat here. Yeah. I, can, I can read them out if you want or... Uh, well, I mean, yes, sure. So there is a question. If, uh, but if, pe if people want to ask first, fine. Yes. But, uh, Please do, do unmute yourself and ask your question if you want. It's I, not okay. Hello? Thank yes. You. Thank you. Well, Hassan, first of all, this was groundbreaking. I mean, I was in tears most of the time. Ah, thank you. Because I'm not just a scholar of migration and refugeeness, but I have, my family has underwent multiple migrations. And this is actually very interesting, your thinking in regard to multiple migrations within the course of just two or three generations. Um, so, so, so to make a very long story brief, for example, my grandfather left, uh, my maternal grandfather left over a hundred years ago as a very poor boy in Greece, went to South Africa and became a multi-billionaire. All of this fortune was, less, was, was lost for different reasons. I am very poor myself right now, but anyway. Um, my, my paternal grandmother was also uh, one of the most prominent Negroponte families in Asia Minor and when the catastrophe happened she had to leave and come as a refugee to Greece so that's also interesting returning to Greece as a refugee being Greek but she didn't come to Greece and she instead she went to Egypt so then my father who was born in 1922 was raised in Egypt um, and he himself um, uh, returned to Greece when he was in his 40s. Um, so there's been multiple migrations um, connected, not necessarily to um, financial migrations. And then my brother left Greece 20 years ago and went to Wales. Now, this is very interesting because my father is an example of a person who obviously left Greece and went to Wales, UK for a better financial future. And he did not succeed. For almost 10 years, he was at the verge of homelessness and I was supporting him uh, so that he would not become homeless. The last five years, he is uh, doing okay. The interesting part is that he's living in this most beautiful natural world place, one of the most beautiful I've seen, you know, in the world. And uh, both he and one of his best friends, who's also Greek, think it's a horrible place. So we see here a 
a, a, a supreme example of nostalgia. I go there and I say, what beauty this is and how I wish I could stay here and look at this nature. And they say, oh, come on, this is awful. The cafes close at 10. These people, they only drink. They never eat the mezze when they drink, so they become drunk. We in Greece, we never drink to drink. We drink while we eat. I mean, all those, a million different things. So, of course, he was struggling in Greece, and if he was not struggling, he would not have left. So he's super glorifying this nostalgia. And I'm just wondering here, um, because you made a very, very interesting point when you mentioned the dichotomy between academia and uh, politics. But I'm wondering how we can, I'm always wondering this thing, how we can take the, this groundbreaking thinking you presented us today and, and put it in lay people's words, because my brother is not an academic. He was a sea captain and then he was whatever, and now he's a milkman and whatever. But to put it in lay people's language that could make them realize their situation because it would be therapeutic in a way if he understood everything you presented to us today, you know. So I'm not going to yeah. go on the thing of talking. Yeah, let me, yeah, thank you. Yeah, let me, let me just say that I think uh, what I said is itself the product of listening to lay people. So, so the relation is really uh, dialectical. It's not that I found some, some truth that I need to convey. The truth came to me from the people I'm, I'm working with. This is in the essence of the anthropological exercise or, so, or sociological for that matter. But, uh, but what, is, what I think is crucial is that, yes, I think there is a function in the academic exercise of putting in words certain things that people formulate but not necessarily very clearly and, and often the most successfully conveyed across the board truths are not things where people say Ah, oh, amazing. I didn't realize this you have. In fact, I, in my experience, when I have managed to communicate something about racism, for instance, or uh, et cetera, when I was doing uh, kind of like public intellectual exercises, it's more people saying to me, I've always knew, known this. You've just put it in a word which helped me express what I've always known. Oh, yeah. So you don't teach people, you just give them tools. Absolutely. To, and so I think that's that's where, where, where we go. Thank you. Thank you. And if I may, I, I would like to just spend a word to, to really uh, praise Rassan's because I think you have a unique style and you unique way to uh, to write and to talk, which is always so accountable to the ethnography to the ethnography you conducted. And it's at once personal yes. uh, and uh, eth deeply ethnographic, uh, as opposed to many sort of anthropologists who take one example and then spend, you know, one line on, 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 on the evidence and then 20 pages on, on, on theories that one gets almost disconnected from the point. So I think this is something that I really want to praise. And for me, it offers really a model for our students as well on how to think about the relationship between ethnography and, and, and the process of writing and, and, and communicating. So really, thank you also in the talk, that was really special. Um, thank you. No, but I think you're muted. I, so all the things I said were I was muted. <laughs> no, you weren't <laughs> muted. Okay, so I just wanted to give I, the floor to Bella. I, I, I heard all the wonderful things you said about <laughs> <That's> me. <laughs> so Bella, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Shasan Hajj, for that lecture. lecture was really insightful. And um, especially, I really liked your concept of nostalgia and the self valorization I never really thought about it like that. Um, yeah, my question is, um based around more 
well, obviously young people, um, but like third generation diasporic communities. Like I'm, I'm third generation Indian Kenyan, uh, you know, the Indian diaspora that went to Kenya. Um, and, and then of course, then, then I moved to Europe and then now I'm in the UK. Um, and a lot of the things that you're talking about, I definitely see with my grandparents um, when they moved to Kenya and they, you know, they had, they were living as if they lived in India almost, you know, with the music they listened to, with the way that the, the house was set up and things. Um, but by the time it came down to me, I was, I already didn't feel you know, very Indian. I was, I was brought up in Kenya. It was this weird, there was some expectations of Indian and Indians in Kenya. And so I also had to go undergo this process of self-valorization, as you said. And then when I came to Europe, I had to go through a whole other process of self-valorization, right? And of course, because I, I, I don't feel like I belong in a specific place. So um, yeah, I was wondering what you think about that one like a diaspora, like someone from a diaspora doesn't actually feel like they but they have one place that they belong to. And if sure. you've thought about that in any way, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, obviously, uh, like in my, in my research, but also personally, I know many Lebanese who are not part of the Lebanese diaspora in any, any sense, in the sense of uh, attachment uh, to anything uh, Lebanese. Uh, so they have inherited uh, a name, uh, but uh, they have inherited sometimes the look even, uh, and they have inherited uh, some food. But when I try to say to them, well, does Lebanon mean anything to you? I say, no, uh, but some do. Uh, so it's a variety, so a variety of intensities again. And uh, uh, so I think uh, diaspora is an inheritance. So you inherit, you have inherited certain, certain, uh, uh, certain genealogy uh, from your parents and your grandparents. And inheritance, some people uh, refuse their inheritance. So some people are unaffected by their inheritance. Some people are determined by their inheritance. So, so how, you, how you, are rela you relate to an inheritance is a very, very uh, complicated uh, thing that varies uh, across the board. So I would definitely uh, not try and be formulaic uh, in trying to establish some, this is people who belong to the diaspora, this is people who don't uh, belong. There's also the problem of, do you use emic or etic, you know, classical, do you use people's feeling of belonging or do you create some category yourself and say, I'm looking and say, yeah, you must be part of the African diaspora, you must be part of the, I don't care what you think. Uh, but at the same time, you're dealing with that problem, it means you are, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't even ask the question. Uh, uh, the fact that the question is there for you is a mode of belonging. Uh, uh, it's not the common mode of belonging, but because for some people, even the question doesn't exist. Like, don't even bother me with Lebanon or whether I, belong. I mean, I just like the fact that you are asking a question about your belonging is a form of belonging. Even if you come to the conclusion that you don't belong, uh, but asking the question is a form of belonging. Uh, that is, it's a form of relation, uh, it's a form of negotiating your inheritance. Uh, because if, if, if not, you wouldn't ask the question. So, so I think uh, like given, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm extrapolating from just two words you said, but uh, I think it's interesting when someone says this because you don't want to imprison yourselves by cliched answers and preconceived answers of what is and what is not and et cetera. And I think this is where 
uh, creativity is very crucial. Uh, you have to, you have to, uh, you might find by going analytically slowly and carefully, you might find that you have in you a non-discovered mode of belonging, uh, which uh, you need to explore. Uh, it's not always the case that people always have the right answer for you from the outside. So you're the best person, in a sense, uh, to deal with that. Thank you, Hassan. That was uh, really um, a, a very cogent answer. I'm just wondering how much you can take, because I, I, I am aware that uh, we are all inhabiting <laughs> In fact, simultaneously multiple uh, places, and you for you it's 10 p.m. in the evening. So uh, I wonder um, if you want to take one or two more questions, or um, you want to um, finish here. Um, so I just wanted to hear how much you you are still sort of. I'm a, I'm not, I'm not that old that I want to go to sleep at 10 p.m. So I can I can I can I mean okay. I can well, cope, uh, I can. I can cope with another. Maybe there, okay. maybe there was, well, maybe there was a gin and tonic with some hummus waiting for you just next door. <laughs> um, so we have plenty of uh, really wonderful questions, and also a lot of people thanking you who had to leave for teaching and other duties. But uh, I think there is um, one question that I I wanted to read out to you because um, okay. uh, I thought uh, someone is mentioning. Um, how much your talk uh, made her think about, or yeah, made her think about Abdel Malik Sayyad's work as well, and uh, whether. Oh, yes. oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that definitely uh, is not by chance. <laughs> I mean, Abdel Malik Sayyad is someone you know. When I worked with Boudou, I had a personal relation with Abdel Malik, and uh, sort of like uh, I learned. I learned a lot from him, and uh, he figures definitely in the book, uh, as in, especially because for Abdul Malik, there is no study of migration, which is not a study from that's both from the sending and receiving country. Uh, you don't do one or the other, and uh, sort of like it is also. So what he calls the double absence, uh, la double absence, which uh, involves a gaze which tries to analyze the migrant both from the perspective of being an emigrant and from the perspective of being an immigrant, as he puts it. And definitely uh, those traces are present in, in the book, uh, explicitly, no, not implicitly. Thanks, Hassan. There is a question from um, Wen uh, Yu Wu. Sorry if I mispronounce. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I wonder how you think about the question of time, the missed ongoing changes of the place in the lentic lenticular phenomenon. Yes, uh, very nice. Well, I mean, that's, that's quite interesting in the sense that I begin by thinking the lenticular, if you remember, by trying to argue that uh, the co conceptions of uh, or forefronting the problematic of time is a Eurocentric, uh, in fact, uh, conception of modernity. So what I'm trying to argue, argue also in the book is that you, what one of the differentiations between European modernity and diasporic uh, modernity is precisely uh, the relation between time and space. Uh, that, dias <coughs> that diasporic modernity, now, you know, I mean, it's not either or, right? It's never either or, either space or time. No, no sophisticated thinker would like to think space without time or time without space. So it's not a question, is it time or is it space? It's a question of what is emphasized in the dialectic between time and space. So like when you think <coughs> of European nostalgia, uh, the structure of European nostalgia is governed by yearning for the past. Now, one of the things about 
thinking nostalgia and time in the past with time is that well the past is never recoverable yeah you can never get the past back now when you are nostalgic for another space it's not the same now it's it's interesting right because we know that when you are nostalgic to another space, you're nostalgic to another space in another time, and therefore uh, the place would have changed. Uh, and so time has had its effect. But if you highlight the question of nostalgia for another space, you cannot say that another space is irretrievable in the way you say the past is irretrievable. In fact, in fact, when you look at, uh, at European poetry about, about memory and space, you get, well, you know, very fair, I mentioned it in the book, uh, the very famous uh, Lamarckian poem about uh, the, la the, la uh, the lake where, where, where he's, he's sitting by the lake remembering his lover where he was on before and his lover has died and he's lamenting the passing of time and saying why can't we stop time so we can enjoy uh, we can enjoy our beautiful moments and then after having said that time can never can never be retrieved he turns to nature around him and say Oh rocks, oh etc. Why don't you carry the memory? That is, he's asking the space because for him the space continues to exist, unlike time, which has been retrieved. So he asks the space to embody the lost memories because it allows the memory to continue. And uh, in a way. Uh, this is what happens with diaspora. You have a primacy of space which allows the continuation of the past because it is embodied in space in a way which is not the same as European nostalgia. This is at least how I analyzed it in the book. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, the, the questions are getting, uh, I mean, we're getting many, many questions and I think we are also running a little bit out of time as people are moving on to um, teaching which, you know, in terms of time starts at 11. Uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, there is time just for last question. So um, uh, there is a question that I think we, we, uh, we promise to ask you on behalf of Roy Russell, who's asking, and I think it's the best way to conclude. Uh, <laughs> did anyone inhabit the world as a space or even the universe, or are we trapped in our experience and attachment to our birthplace? <laughs> Repeat the beginning. Did anyone inhabit the world as a space or even as a universe? Or are we trapped in our experience and attachment to our birthplace? Oh, well, I mean, I think, I think uh, that's a lovely, lovely way to end on this existential uh, transcendental note. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. I <th> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think I have one of the things I have always highlighted and the highlight is, is precisely that we are never trapped in the spaces we are, we are inhabiting because those spaces. Um, so in actually the book, I do, I do a lot of work on the difference between metaphor, metaphoric and metonymic realities. So uh, because to understand to understand how our surrounding takes us beyond our surroundings. So you're looking at a photo, as I said, you're looking at a photo, you're, you're in Sydney, you look at a photo of your mother in Lebanon. Now, is this photo a metaphor of Lebanon or a metonym? 
that is, for, you, for those of you who don't know the linguistic based differentiation, a metaphor is something that replaces the reality. So it is not the reality, it's an order which represents the reality. A metonymy, metonymy is something from that reality that represents the reality. So the photo is part of Lebanon. It's an extension of Lebanon. If it, it is a metonymy, it is an extension of Lebanon, an incursion of Lebanon into Sydney space or whatever space. And so if it is a metonymy, that's why it becomes part of a reality. If it is a metaphor, you say, okay, I'm in Australia and I remember thanks to the photo, which is a representation of something which is outside. So I advocate a metonymic sort of like elaboration, which always makes us move outside space and into the universe. Uh, and that has to engage with the work of our imagination just as much as, as the empirical reality. Brilliant. I try. But, but, thank you so much, Hassan, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I, I really think this was a, a really special um, lecture for many kinds of reasons, some of which have been also mentioned in the list, some people thought it was self-therapeutical. <laughs> and there is a sense that Hassan, you are uh, not only just a public intellectual and offering us really um, uh, hope in the discipline, uh, in its the indirect intervention in, 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 in the possibility and the potentiality to change the world, but also um, you, you, you offer some therape therapeutical and uh, somehow um, counseling effects to, to the extent that everyone feels connected, feels moved, feels uh, really that what you have to say speaks to their everyday and uh, histories of migration and, um, and of um, inhabiting the world from where, wherever they are. And I really want to thank you for this, for which is not just what you've done with this talk and with this book that we are really looking forward to read, but I think in the wider uh, work that you've produced over the past decades. So really, thank you so much you. Um, for pushing our boundaries. And uh, thank you yeah. very much, Roba. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you all for your question and for listening. Uh, and I hope I didn't ruin your breakfast or, or anything like this. <laughs> that was fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll leave you with um, Kim, who will um, just explain um, something about the recording and where you will be able to find it. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you all and goodbye. <laughs>